Tennessee Crossroads is being brought to you by Nashville Public Television and by the Tennessee Department of Agriculture and USDA Rural Development. Tennessee's wine country produces internationally recognized wines and traditional local wines made from indigenous grapes. Find a directory and tour information at picktnproducts.org. This time on Tennessee Crossroads, Rob Wiles profiles a West Tennessee artist pursuing her creative passion despite crippling odds. I'll take you to Columbia to ride through history on some vintage iron. Tammy Arnder gallops down to Franklin to witness some cutting horse ballet. And Susan Watson explores Pegram's Mud Puddle Pottery Studio. Quite a show just for you. It's Tennessee Crossroads time. I'm Joel Moore. Thanks for joining us. It's a fact of life that disease can sometimes cripple a human body, but not necessarily the human spirit or a person's creative health. That's what Rob Wiles discovered on a recent trip to West Tennessee where he met Ella Mae Clark. Now, she's a Brownsville artist who refused to let a crippling condition get in the way of her passion. Ella Mae Clark is an outsider in a lot of ways. She lives outside of the town of Brownsville, out in the, the farm country of West Tennessee where the rows are so green. Looks like they could have been painted by an artist. Now living in the country might be an obstacle to some artists, but not to Ella Mae Clark. Now she's faced obstacles a lot bigger than that almost her whole life. Oh, Lord, my God. You can tell Ella Mae is filled with joy when she's painting. What you can't readily tell is that she's also ravaged by constant pain from rheumatoid arthritis, which struck her when she was 11 years old. The works the hands has made. My hands, they uh, gnaw like this when I was uh, like 14. And so they, they have got a little worse, you know, over time, but, uh, when I paint, it's really exercise for me. <laughs> and I continue to, you know, try to use my hands as much as possible. Ella Mae has used that form of exercise for as long as she can remember, even though her childhood was marked by the disease that is still with her. I stayed at home most of the time, though, with my mom. And uh, the rest of my siblings, they would go to the field and, you know, work the fields with my father and all. and. Just uh, from, from time to time, they, I would go sometime whenever I was able to go. Mm -hmm. But I really was like un, under the doctor most of my younger years mm -hmm. all the time. I enjoyed my, you know, my childhood days. I really did mm -hmm. because, you know, everything back then, uh, people would, you know, they would raise their gardens and they would, you know, do the crops and everything. Mm -hmm. And so we just, we had it pretty good growing up because mm -hmm. my father, he was sharecropper. And so, like I say, then I did make it, I made it through school, not all the way, but I did go for the ninth grade. All right. <laughs> yeah, and so I was blessed to do that, and I thank God for that. <laughs> Ella Mae thanks God for many things, including giving her her talent. As far as I remember, I always loved to sketch, you know, and I would always, as a, as a small child, I would always love to just, when I was around the house, I would just be have a pen, a pencil in my hand, crayon, or grab paper I could find. I always would do, you know, be doodling on that, mm -hmm. doing something, and making, you know, different little sketches. And then uh, from that, my my ideas just grew, you know, they they would just grew, and I had a passion for it. I loved to do it, and so I always liked to, you know, make up stories, and I would, you know, draw like characters and different things. I like to do all that. Mm -hmm. And then as I got older, then I, I remember I told my grandson, and he was saying, after I had married, he was saying that, uh, he said, well, Granny, he called me Granny. He said, uh, you ought to start painting instead of just drawing and then painting. And that was a good idea. I thought about it, I said, that makes sense. And it makes sense for art lovers, too. 
LMA falls into the outsider school, self-trained artists who don't follow the classical rules of art. Now this outsider artist is getting her works hung inside in a gallery in Jackson for a start. LMA's inspirations don't come from the classroom. And everything I do is not copied. It's from my memory. It's fresh. I say it come out of my head, but it comes from within, you know. And uh, just like women, I love to do women and children. And I love to do children in the park, stuff like that. And uh, I like to do them at play, doing different things, you know. Each of her paintings tells a story. This guy gonna have the nerve to have on some yellow socks. Now he know that don't go. Like the story of the love-struck man about to take that big step. He's on one knee, he has the ring in the box, he's proposing. <laughs> and she got her eyes all bucked because she, she shocked that he has proposed. And he picked the place to propose to her by that lake and that mountain in the background. What do you think she said to him? Uh, she, she eventually would say yes, <laughs> but she shocked first. <laughs> She's very shocked, I can tell. <laughs> LMA's subjects range from the mountains to the ocean. These are places she's never been. She hasn't gotten to travel much because of her arthritis. So her paintings are escape to new places where the pain isn't so bad. I, I don't think about it. And I, I think that's a way of me escaping a lot of time from the pain. I like to really get somewhere and just, just by myself and, you know, do a painting. And I, I find that mm, that gives me a lot of serenity. And, and indeed, I can think better. To think about her work and where her painting will take her and us, somewhere close to her heart and far away from the disease that cripples her. What an amazing lady. Thanks a lot, Rob. And if you'd like to find out how you can see some of LMA's work yourself, go to our website, of course, TennesseeCrossroads.org. Well, you've heard you can't judge a book by its cover. Well, maybe you can't judge a building by its exterior. Case in point, we found a drab building down in Columbia that advertises itself as a motorcycle shop. Well, inside, we discovered a wealth of history about cycles and, well, some interesting characters that make S&G custom cycles custom made for a Crossroads story. Years ago, we'd laugh about it. The old fella, he could lose his new refrigerator. He could lose his, he could lose his car. He could lose his house. <laughs> but that motorcycle would be the last thing to go. Motorcycles have been in Sam Goodman's family for three generations. From his grandfather's Harley shop that opened in 1919 to this. What is this? Well, if you need a custom bike built or a vintage bike restored, S&G Custom Cycles is your place. It's also a virtual museum of motorcycle history. With hundreds of models from all over the world and mostly pre-World War II. You'll notice a lot of the engineering that went on these things was excellent. I mean, you might look at it and think of an old plow point or something, but by gosh, it was a lot of effort went into this thing to, to make it. And it, you think that now we've got the, the smartest thing that ever was, and we'll even go back now, and a lot of the stuff they got now is stuff that they've used in the past. They've just re-innovated it. Sam was a top fuel drag racing crew chief before devoting full time to the family business. He well, we took me on a tour of the there, endless collection of antiques that fill his back room, me, along with bike. customer bikes waiting to Everything be customized to like this one. Noise. We took the thing all apart and then took it apart and bare painted it and we painted the frame. We did just a little bit of motor work, freshen the motor, but you'll notice the motor's painted all between the fins and everything, all the little stuff. When it's flip-flop paint and the paint on these That's things, nice is, here. yeah, it's about $3,000 worth of paint on it. Wow. You got a lot of fellas that rode years ago and uh, they got out of it because of uh, marriages. They got married and a lot of them had kids. A lot of them had a family to try to raise and stuff and they had to quit. Okay. Now they're coming back into it. Man. And actually the machines that's out there now is so much better made. Before they had just, I remember taking it, you, you couldn't leave a house without wrenches or bailing wire or something to make <laughs> this thing run. 
And now you can actually get on the machine and ride them and, and not have no trouble out of them. Here in the shop, there are all kinds of projects in the works or waiting for the skilled hands of s and craftsmen. One of them's my cousin, Neil Goodman, and the other's Charlie Penrod. And them boys, they, they just excellent on what they do. Charlie's a good fabricator on anything. I don't think if you just pulled up with anything, he'd have an idea what to do to make that girl run again. We're going to take this thing completely all apart, down to everything, nuts and bolts and all, and put it back like it came from the factory. Next stop, the Bear Cave. Now, Bear Henson may look like his nickname in a way, but you quickly learn that this den is the domain of a sensitive artist who applies his talents to everything from portraits to, of course, custom-painted bikes like this one. The fellow that owns it lives in uh, Rutherford County, and he came to me and sat down and said that he wanted to uh, portray some of the uh, Confederate generals. He told me a little bit about his uh, personal family history, and he's a son of the Confederate veterans, and very proud of that heritage, and wanted to tastefully display that on the bike. <laughs> Back upstairs, customers often come in for a little impromptu bluegrass jam, to share bike tales, and to check the latest old acquisitions like the ones Ronnie Mangrum showed me. The chopper craze started right after World War II. Uh, I guess our veterans been living on the edge fighting the Germans and the Japanese. When they come home, they riding regular motorcycles just didn't seem exciting enough for them. Now this is a real rare bird right here. This is a 1934 Broth Superior. Um, a lot of people mispronounce it too, they call it brogue, but broth is the proper pronunciation. This is also the bike that uh, Lawrence of Arabia got killed on after he survived all that fighting in the Middle East way back in the early 1900s. And came to England, was riding around on one of these things, and wrecked it and killed him. It's easy to see why bikers and their families get attached to this shop. It's a fun place. And of course, there's always Belle, the store mascot. However, some customers get so attached, they never leave, like Willis Gordon Turbin. He had a phobia from his childhood about being buried in the ground. He did not want to be buried in the ground. So in 1989, he was diagnosed with terminal lung cancer. And they, so he made a deal with the owner, Sam, and said that uh, if I get myself cremated, can I keep hanging out in the shop? And he still oversees the operation today. The operation today is no typical biker hangout. In fact, there's nothing <laughs> typical about this place at all. It's here and open to all curious visitors thanks to the passion that's shared by Sam and all of his staff. It's a passion for the history, technology, and romance of motorcycles. And as long as that passion persists, the shop will persevere. I don't want to get too big at it, I'll be honest with you. I'm not a smart enough person to keep, a, keep it all in line. And I just, I'm barely lame to get up and keep things going like I got. I like it like that. I'm simple at it. It's better, for, it's better that way to me. And I'm going to keep it low keyed and enjoy it. And rear back and watch it go if I can. I try to be an old man and watch it go. That's one fun place. Tennessee is well known for its Tennessee walking horses, but it's also gaining a reputation for its cutting horses as well. Now these quick thinking, agile animals work with their riders using perfect timing and rhythm. Well, right now, Tammy Arinder takes us down to Franklin to meet some of the riders and their horses who are, well, gotta say it, a cut above the rest. Oh, you can feel the muscles, you can feel the, the intensity, just like being that tight wound and when things are happening, stuff like that. Yeah, you can feel all that. 